Hello, everyone. What I would like to do today is look at the role of gut microbes in stress-related disorders in children. Now, when we look at your average 10-year-old child, they have a, approximately a half a kilogram of bacteria in their intestine. They have slightly more bacteria in their intestine than they do human cells in their body. So in fact, like other humans, children are more microbial than they are human. They have about a hundred times more DNA in these bacteria than they do in the cells within their bodies. So the bacteria contain an enormous volume of DNA an enormous capacity to produce various molecules. Now, in terms of the phyla of bacteria, they're, the predominant phyla are Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes, and there are over a thousand species present in your average 10-year-old child. Now, what determines the composition of the gut microbiota in a child? Well, the factors are very similar to that in an adult. The first big determinant in any child of the gut microbiota is how that child was born. A baby born by cesarean section has a very different initial gut microbiota to that of a baby born per vaginum. The baby born per vaginum picks up lactobacilli as it passes through the mum's birth canal. The baby born by cesarean section, in marked contrast, picks up bacteria from the skin of the doctor, the skin of the nurse, the skin of the mom. So the initial microbiota of the baby born by cesarean section is very different to that of the baby born per vaginum. Now, over the first two to three years of life, there's a convergence in the microbiota in both situations. So by the age of three, any differences between babies born by cesarean section and per vaginum, there'd be very subtle differences indeed. Now, other important initial factors would be exposure to antibiotics. If a baby obviously is born prematurely, they're much more likely to be exposed to antibiotics. And we know that if a baby has been exposed to more than one course of antibiotics in the first year of life, the chances of that child being overweight or obese later on is radically increased. The other major factors in determining the gut microbiota at this age would be obviously the diet. We'll talk a little about that later on. The genetics of the baby, which obviously, you know, one has no uh, role to play in determining one's own genetics, but the genetics of the, of the child obviously will determine the gut microbiota. Whether the child is very active or not will determine a baby or a child who is very active and runs around a lot is going to have a somewhat different microbiota to a baby or to, to a child who is far less active. And we know that stress does play a role in determining the gut microbiota content. So how do the gut microbes of a child communicate with the brain? Well, they communicate in a variety of ways. The vagus nerve is a long meandering nerve, which both in the child and the adult carries information from brain to gut and from gut to brain. So we know, and it's been clearly demonstrated in, in, in my lab and in other labs, that certain microbes can only communicate with the brain when the vagus nerve is intact. If the vagus nerve was damaged in any way, you wouldn't have that information transmitted from gut microbes to brain. Other very important routes of communication in children between the microbes and the brain would be the production of short chain fatty acids like butyrate, propionate, acetate. Butyrate, propionate, and acetate can travel in the bloodstream to the brain. And we know that particularly butyrate has the capacity to impact the way genes in the brain function or operate. In other words, they are epigenetic modulators. They modulate the way in which genes in the brain can function. 
technically they are HDAC inhibitors, these um, uh, short chain fatty acids. Another important route of communication is the production of tryptophan. Now, everyone will have heard of serotonin because it's an important neurotransmitter in the human brain. And serotonin regulates mood. It seems to be involved in sleep and appetite regulation as well. Now, microbes within the gut, particularly bifidobacteria, are capable of producing tryptophan, which is the building block of serotonin. Now, another source of tryptophan will be the diet, but microbes such as bifidobacteria are capable of producing tryptophan. Tryptophan travels to the brain via the bloodstream. And in the brain, it is converted to serotonin. Now, why that is important is that the human brain and the brain of the child has very limited storage capacity for tryptophan. So the child needs a constant supply of tryptophan reaching the brain so that serotonin levels remain constant and optimal. So they're just some of the parallel routes through which gut microbes communicate uh, with the brain. Now, when we look at bacteria within the, the intestine of a child, we see that many of these bacteria are capable of producing um, neurotransmitters. In fact, all of the common neurotransmitters we see in the child's brain can be produced by microbes within the gut. Now, I'm not suggesting that these neurotransmitters travel to the brain, but what I am suggesting is that they can influence aspects of the nervous system around the gut, which in turn can influence brain function. So neurotransmitters like GABA, serotonin, noradrenaline, dopamine, these are all manufactured by microbes within the gut. Now, when we look at an infant, the, um, the dominant species in the infant is undoubtedly bifidobacteria longum. And the levels of bifidobacteria longum increase during pregnancy in the mum, but the levels in the, in, in the infant are incredibly high. And we've known for a long time that bifidobacteria longum is very much associated with health. It's a very good bacteria. It has uh, very many physiological functions with, within the infant and within the child, and is generally regarded as a good marker for health. Now, it's worth pointing out, and I think we all know, we can't change the genes in ourselves. Maybe sometimes in the future, we'll get to that particular point. But beyond the fertilized ovum, it is not possible to change genes in, the humans, in human cells. But we can change the genes in our gut microbiota. And given the vast array of DNA in the gut microbiota and the very important role it plays physiologically, um, it is, I think, important that we can change that and that people recognize that we can change our gut microbiotas. Now, this is a study we did here in Cork. And I think it's an interesting study because as I mentioned earlier on, Children born by cesarean section, as opposed to born per vagina, do initially have a, have a gut microbiota that's different, but by two to three years, those differences disappear. But the question I, we wanted to ask here is, is it possible that those first two to three years where the microbiota is different could have certain impacts or, or, or impact on brain function. And what we were particularly interested here is on looking at stress response. So we asked the question, if you took a group of university students who were born by cesarean section and a group of university students who were born per vagina, would their stress responses be different? Now, one of the ways in which stress is often measured in a laboratory is with a test called the Trier Social Stress Test. And the Trier Social Stress Test essentially is presenting when somebody is relatively naive to presentation, they're asked to present in front of a short or a small audience. That is a stressful phenomenon for most individuals who are not used to presenting in public. And what it does is it elevates cortisol levels. 
So we were interested in seeing, would the response to the trier social stress test in children who were born by cesarean section be the same as those who were born per vagina? And what we essentially found was in most ways in which we looked at this, we found that the stress levels were higher in those who were born by cesarean section. So what we essentially found was, I'm not suggesting that these are massive differences, but there are most definitely robust differences. Children born by cesarean section have higher stress responses in late teens than children born per vagina. Now, when you look at stress in children, there's no doubt it has increased as it has in adults throughout the COVID uh, crisis. When you look at surveys pre-COVID, about 12% of children, maybe sometimes higher, report stress in their lives. But during this COVID pandemic, the rates of reporting of stress in children has went up to about 40%, so way higher than it is normally. And that's, I think, you know, a, a very important observation because stress gives rise to a variety of psychological problems in children. Um, the Hanselia is on the right of that um, slide here. And Hanselia was the first to point out that stress gave rise to a variety of medical disorders. But in children, we know that stress is associated with anxiety. It's associated with depression. It's associated with GI disturbance like irritable bowel syndrome. It's associated with headaches in children. It's associated with school refusal. Now, school refusal is no longer regarded as a diagnostic entity in children, but parents will certainly recognize it because the child who may have been going to school for six or 12 months suddenly decides that they don't want to go to school that they're far too anxious. So these are psychological disorders that are stress related and occur in children. Now, what do we know about diet, the gut microbiota and mental health? Well, this is data from Felisa Jacka, and she reports that the higher intake of unhealthy foods by mothers during pregnancy are related to increased externalizing behavior in children. Now, externalizing behavior would be aggressive type behavior, whereas a higher intake of unhealthy foods by children are related to increased internalizing and externalizing behavior in children. Now, internalizing behavior would be anxiety, depression. As I said, externalizing behavior would be aggressive type behavior. Now, the healthy microbiota in a child is associated with a stress axis that doesn't release too much cortisol. Cortisol is the main stress hormone. And if the child is healthy, one doesn't see an excessive release of, of, of cortisol. One doesn't see an excessive activation of the immune system. When we're stressed, the immune system can activate in response to stress, not just in response to bacteria or viruses, but stress as well. And we also see diversity in the gut microbiota. So a diverse microbiota is associated with health, a cortisol release that isn't excessive, and an immune system that isn't overactive. Now, we know that in depression, and I think there's no reason to assume that a depressed child is different to a depressed adult. We know that in depression, that the gut microbiota loses diversity, that it's not as diverse as it would be in a healthy individual who is not suffering from depression. So depression is associated with decreased diversity. Now we've just finished a study and we've looked at, at, at individuals in their late teens and early twenties and we find similar findings in children or, or adults with a social anxiety disorder. Now, a few years ago, we introduced the concept of a psychobiotic, which we said was a bacteria, which we ingested in adequate amounts has a positive mental health benefit. So it's a bacteria, when we ingest it in adequate amounts, it has a positive mental health benefit. And this is just one example. It's a placebo controlled trial um, in, um, late teens and early 20s, where we 
gave them either a biflongum or placebo. And what we essentially found is when they were taking biflongum, they reported themselves as less stressed and their morning cortisol, which is a very good indication of stress. We measure cortisol in the saliva. Their morning cortisol was low. So, so basically they felt less stressed on the biflongum and their output of cortisol was decreased. Not only that, but we found that certain cognitive tasks were improved. Here, we were looking at paired associate learning. Paired associate learning would be um, a child remembering that they left their copy book on the kitchen table. And we found that paired associate learning was actually improved when the subjects were taking Biff Longham. When we look at late teens, and who were doing exams in university, we found in again in a placebo controlled trial that a biff longum improved sleep duration during an exam. So coming during the exam period, obviously many children or, or teenagers will sleep less. Here we found that the during the exam period, the sleep duration was actually much higher than it was if the subject was taking placebo. So sleep quality as measured by sleep duration was better when individuals were taking the probiotic. Now, prebiotics are a substrate that is selectively utilized by high, host microorganisms and confers a health benefit. And these are some of the vegetables associated with high levels of prebiotic fibers. Jerusalem artichoke is the highest level of prebiotic fiber per gram. Now, when we look at the beneficial effects of human milk oligosaccharides, human milk oligosaccharides are not metabolized to any extent as they pass through the intestine. They do reach the large intestine or the colon relatively unmetabolized, and then they are acted upon by bacteria within the gut. And they have very definite health benefits. They have antiviral and antimicrobial activity. They, they promote the growth of good bacteria. So they're prebiotic. They promote the growth of good bacteria. They also have very favorable effects in terms of epithelial and mucosal barrier function. And of course, they optimally impact the immune system in the developing infant. Now, HMOs are obviously present in human milk. They're also now present in, 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 in some infant formula as well, but they clearly have very good health benefits acting through the gut microbiota. Now, another component of uh, the diet that can have a very good impact um, on the gut microbiota, but directly on the brain as well, is of course fish oils in the form of EPA and DHA. They're polyunsaturated fatty acids. And I think we were probably the first group to show that EPA, the polyunsaturated fatty acid actually promotes microbial diversity. So it acts on the, the gut microbiota to promote diversity. Um, you know, I, I suppose speaking just from personal experience as, as a parent, it, it was always very difficult to get my children when they were young to eat fish, but there's no doubt about it that fish given its high levels of polyunsaturated fatty acid is a very good dietary component in children because the developing brain needs polyunsaturated fatty acids. And not only that, but the polyunsaturated fatty acids promote diversity in the gut microbiota. So if one can get children to eat fish, I think that's a very, very good um, uh, dietary component uh, to take in. So when we look at the gut microbiota and the impact on the brain, if we look at a, a diet that is rich in fermented foods, rich in fruit and vegetables, and again, it's difficult often to get children to eat a lot of fruit and vegetables, but they're rich in polyphenols and they have very good health impacts. Um, and a good diet will be high, will be high, will have high levels of fiber, which will promote the growth of good bacteria and also promote the production of short chain fatty acids. So a good diet has many different components that are really positive in terms of the developing child. Whereas it, a very 
highly processed diet and it's difficult to get children to keep away from processed foods but you know fast foods and highly processed foods do not promote diversity in the gut microbiota and overall if they're if they're a consistent part of the diet certainly are not good and are associated associated with higher levels of anxiety. So I think the children, the diet of the child is certainly, you know, something that one needs to look at when one is talking about mental health. Sometimes mental health, we look at, we look at genetics. What was the mental health of the parents like? We often look at the stress in the child's environment, but we tend to ignore a very important component of, of, of the stress response. And that's actually the diet the child is on. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, gut microbes are essential for normal brain function. The gut microbiota is often dysregulated by stress and stress related disorders, are we all, as we all know, are common in children. And I would suggest that in children, the most important thing is to have a good diet, but psychobiotics and prebiotics have potential in managing stress-related disorders in children. Thank you very much for your attention.